My name is Leslie, and um, I'm here to share my story with you today. Sound three, this is Jesus My Savior with Leslie, take one, and three, two, one. I truly believe that this can be anybody's story and not just mine, and I want to share hope. I want to share um, love and the the message that that you're loved no matter what you've gone through. So I'll start a little bit of my background. Um, my dad is from Iran and my mom is from Mexico. And I am first generation here in America uh, from both sides. And so I'd like to have, you know, a more holy story that my parents, um, of how my parents met. So I kind of like to say that they met in church, but really they were working at Church's Chicken. <laughs> and. Um, and so that's how that's how they met. So when they um, when my parents met, they were my dad was still in college and my mom was um, pretty young. And they got married six months later after they met, and then they had me a few years later. Um, I have a younger brother who's uh, six years younger than me, and. And that was our, our little family. Uh, growing up in America with immigrant parents who are from completely different cultures and countries, what it, it had its challenges. Not only not only did they have the language barrier, but there were the cultural differences. And so, although there was a lot of of love in the house, there was also a lot of tension. Um, especially after I was born, the war. Um, the Iran-Iraq war broke out, and so a lot of my family was still over there. And it put a lot of pressure on my dad because he was the, the oldest son. And um, he was supposed to go back to Iran, but his, his parents said that it was better for him to stay because of, of the condition of the country. He took care of us as a family, but he also took care of his family financially back home and one by one brought his sisters and brothers here. So that also put a lot of, um, a lot of strain on the family. As, as, I, as I got older, um, I did experience, um, I, was, I was abused as a young child um, sexually, I was abused mentally and emotionally. Um, all of that made me um, kind of retreat to myself um, because there was so much that I was carrying and I didn't feel, I didn't feel loved, I didn't feel seen, I felt invisible. But on the outside, I still felt like a normal person. And I so badly still wanted to fit in. Um, so I did my studies. I carried on like nothing, you know, was wrong. And I just wanted to be and feel like a normal person. And, but on the inside, I had so much anger and fear and self-hate. 
And I was embarrassed of that part of my life. Um, we did not grow up in church. Um, because of the cultural differences, there was um, no, we didn't have any, um, my dad was Muslim, my mom was Catholic. She wasn't a practicing Catholic, but, um, so there was no talk of God in our house. So I didn't really know who, what was church, what was God, anything like that. When I was a, a freshman in high school, we had, uh, I, played, I played volleyball, and my coach had us pray the Our Father prayer before every game. I'd never heard it before. <laughs> and I remember um, being really terrified because everybody around me knew this prayer and I had no clue what they were saying. I felt like everybody was in a cult and I just wanted to run away. It scared me because it, they were so passionate about this and it, I had no idea where this was coming from. And, but by the, end of the, by the end of the season, I learned the, the prayer of the Our Father from, from my coach. So that was my first I think um, my first encounter with with anything religious. I wasn't allowed to spend the night with friends. You know, it's not really in our culture to, to stay over other people's houses. And um, the first time that I started, was able to spend the night with my friends was in high school. And I guess the, you know, the stipulation for me to spend the night was uh, that they would go to church on Sunday. And so I would ask my parents, is it okay, we're gonna go to church? And, you know, they said, that's fine, you can, you can go. So I went to, a f with a few different friends, I went to um, a few different denominations, and, but it wasn't until um, I went to Catholic Mass and we knelt down before um, before the altar um, in preparation for the altar, and I just started crying because I felt a presence. I felt love. I felt comfort, and I'll I'll never forget that. I didn't know exactly what it was, um, but I felt it. I, I remember my senior year, um, a catalyst, something that, that triggered me to know that I needed more healing. And it was a movie that I saw and it was a scene of a young girl being sexually assaulted. And I froze. I couldn't move, I didn't want to talk. And the reality and the power of the truth of what happened to me was too much for me. And I really think that's probably what started my search for something more. I didn't know who to go to. I didn't know what to, but somehow I always ended up going back to the Catholic Church because I wanted that peace that I felt. I wanted that, I wanted to, to have that permanently and I didn't have it. It was my the end of my senior year of high school. I started um, going to speak to the priest and just asking him questions. He was so so nice because I would I would show up without a, without an appointment and just 
um, talked to him for hours, and he encouraged me to join RCIA. So when I went to college, I joined RCIA, and right before we were supposed to receive all of our um, sacraments, a classmate of mine, well, just she was part of the group that, from RCIA, told me, you just get to do RCIA and, and be a part of the church. It's not fair. And so then all my insecurities came back, and I thought, I'm not worthy. Maybe there's something I'm missing. And I left. I didn't, I didn't finish that year. But what I did was that summer, I went back home and received the sacrament of baptism. At the time I was dating my now husband, we were, we were dating about a year and a half, the end of my sophomore year. Um, and he was in his senior year of college, um, and we got pregnant. And so we started our family, and we knew we wanted to get married, and I wanted to get married in the Catholic Church. So I had to finish my sacraments in order to receive communion and, and my sacrament of marriage inside the church. So for the third time, I went through RCIA, and this time I finished. So I received my sacrament of First Communion, First Reconciliation, um, uh, Confirmation, and then Sacrament of Marriage. So we were, we were a young family, and my husband ended up joining the military. And we thought he was gonna get stationed somewhere close by Houston, and he did not. He was stationed in Germany. And so my daughter and I stayed in Houston so that I could finish my, um, my degree. We spent the next two years living apart. When I graduated, um, as I have a, a degree in photography, digital media, my daughter and I joined my husband. We reunited our family and in Germany, I was playing volleyball in Germany. Um, and I remember one day um, we were on a break and a water break and I went to, to drink some water and I started coughing. Um, I thought that was weird. I couldn't drink water and I thought, oh, whatever, I'll just go back to practice and finished out the practice. Then the next day when I drank water again, again, I was coughing. And I thought, that's, that's really weird. And um, I, had, I, I had lost my voice. I was hoarse. And it was during the winter, so I thought, okay, maybe I have a little cold or something. And my voice just, it never came back. And um, so I went to the doctor. I told him, whenever I drink water, I start coughing up and it's just, it's horrible. He wrote a, a referral for me to see a doctor in Longstuhl. And I was, I was getting these intense pressure headaches, you know, um, throughout, throughout the, the leading weeks. I saw the, the ENT for maybe 10 minutes, if that. And he put a, like a camera down my nose and he said, after he was finished, he said, well, you're paralyzed on your left vocal cord and you'll never be able to talk again. I didn't know what was going on. And they said it could be cancer, it could be something more. And I wouldn't know, I would, they would have to do more testing. We were actually gonna go to, to the Vatican that Easter. The Friday, we were leaving on Saturday, and it was the Friday before Easter, um, my headaches got so bad. So we, my husband took me to, to, the, um, to the military base to fill out some paperwork to see if we could schedule something. And 
the lady saw how um, how bad of shape I was that she said, let me call somebody downtown in Germany and see if we can't get you in to see a specialist at a German hospital, which that would never happen. And it's Friday, almost four o'clock, right before the holidays. And so my husband drives me to the hospital. And I'm standing there and all of a sudden, the whole left side of my body just gives out. I go numb and I'm leaning on the wall. I can't ask for help because I don't speak German. And so by the time my husband comes to get me, I just kind of collapse in his arms and they rush me, they, get, they put me in a wheelchair, they rush me to see the ENT and they immediately admit me to the, to the hospital. I fell asleep Friday and I honestly did not wake up till Sunday. That was the time, the passion of Jesus, you know? He, he allowed me to sleep and rest for those three days. There was a little tiny TV screen that was up in the corner. And every time I woke up, I would see on this screen people praying in a church. And I thought, oh, it's probably just a show. Um, but every time I woke up, that same show was on, you know? And so once I finally woke up on Easter Day, I asked the nurse, what, what is that? And she said, oh, there's a chapel downstairs. Well, it was a Marian hospital, and Mary is my patron saint. And I just knew that I needed to get down there. And in my weakness, I don't know how long it took me to get down there, just slowly made, you know, my my journey to, to the to the chapel. And I again here I was on my knees, you know, and I'm crying. I remember praying from all this pain that I was carrying. I said, I can't do this by myself anymore. Lord, I give this all to you. I need you. And in an instant, it felt like two seconds, but in an instant, every painful memory of my life, just of every bad memory of when I was hurt, just... And then I just remember taking this big breath and I felt just everything lifted from me. And I realized in that moment that that was Jesus saying to me, I've been with you the whole time. You've never been alone. And that I'm here with you. And that was, that was the moment that changed my life. I knew that everything that I had been searching for, I found in, in that instant when I opened my heart and I pleaded to Jesus to be there with me. After um, about nine or 10 months, on my birthday, August 22nd, which is the coronation of Mary, um, she gave me my voice back. And I'll, I'll never forget that. I thought it was the best birthday present ever. The journey and the continued learning and the people that, that 
God has put in my path to continue showing me how much He loves me, how much He, um, how He died for me, and 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 the significance of allowing me to share in His passion and having that resurrection of a new life. I just. I'm so grateful and thankful. When I gave myself to Jesus, that's when my life changed. And now with my artwork, I use it to build women by honoring them and allowing them to see themselves, how they were created in the image of God, and help them to shed those lies that they believe about themselves by seeing their beauty and seeing their worth. When a woman is in front of my camera, this is a chance for her to see the creation and the daughter of God that she is, to help from that day forward to use those gifts to honor her life and those around her to make use of the goodness in their lives. So to this day, uh, Jesus walks with me to deeper and deeper healing. Um, I think it's a journey, an ongoing journey that is always going to be a part of my life. But what He does is He reaches His hand to those broken pieces of me as a little girl and pulls me from the corner. And He brings me into the light. And so, He's never going to give up on me, and He wants me to be fully who I am with Him. And because of that, Jesus is my Savior. My life is a miracle. Every child has a story of God's love to share. Shalom world, tune into God's love story.